with us now to talk more about all of this. MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin and Charles Coleman, a former prosecutor in Brooklyn, New York, who is now a civil rights attorney. He is also an MSNBC legal analyst. So, Lisa, you were inside the courtroom for the sentencing. What was that like? It was somber, Jose, because, of course, this is the second time that Alan Weisselberg has pled guilty to a crime associated with his service to the Trump Organization. However, it lasted only a matter of minutes. Alan Weisselberg entering the courtroom this morning dressed in a zip-up jacket and sweatpants. That's as sure an indication as any that a defendant expects to go straight from their sentencing to jail. And that's indeed what happened to Alan Weisselberg this morning. Once the judge heard that both the district attorney and Alan Weisselberg's lawyers had no disagreement with the five-month sentence to which he had previously agreed, he was immediately handcuffed and escorted out a back door to the courtroom, where presumably he was put in a car and taken directly to Rikers Island, where he previously served another five-month sentence, Jose. Charles, what do you make of this new five-month sentence for Weisselberg? Well, I think it's a deal that was likely struck between D.A. Bragg's office and Mr. Weisselberg for the simple fact that at some point you have to basically acknowledge that the jig is up. And I think that Alan Weisselberg ultimately decided that this is what he was going to do. This is the plea deal that he took. Uh, and then rather than sort of go through and, and continue to, to fight it, uh, he knew that jail wasn't likely going to be inevitable. I think that Alan Bragg's office probably made that extremely clear to him. And they were ultimately going to settle on a number. The number, I would say, Jose, is a, probably a, refre a reflection and a function of his age, uh, where he is in life, and the likelihood that he will pose future harm. Um, and so five months to someone uh, of that age is, is a very significant deal. Uh, and I think that's probably how they were able to arrive and agree upon that sentence. So will Lisa Weisselberg have a role in Trump's hush money case? No, he won't, although he certainly could have, Jose. You know, one of the things about the allegations in this upcoming trial is that there are principally two people who are said to have been in the room with Trump or on the phone with Trump where critical conversations were had or arrangements were made, and they are Michael Cohen and Alan Weisselberg. Now we know that one of those two people is almost certain not to step foot in that courtroom, and that's Alan Weisselberg. That in and of itself is a victory for the DA's office because although Michael Cohen will undergo what I expect will be a vigorous cross-examination, there is no one else who can challenge his accounts of some of those critical conversations about the setup of the settlement payment to Stormy Daniels and, of course, what's really being charged here, which is the cover-up of those payments, which was orchestrated to ensure that he would win, he meaning former President Trump, would win that election. That's the charge that the DA has made here. And now Alan Weisselberg won't be there to contest that that's what Michael Cohen says happened. Yeah, and Charles, I mean, we've been seeing this former president is trying all sorts of last minute maneuvers to delay the start of this hush money trial. Do these types of last minute efforts usually work? Jose, they're usually not successful. This is not something that you usually see as being common in terms of defendants trying to get out of going to trial. Ultimately, we know that when you are facing a prosecutor's office, when the prosecution's ready, you have to be ready and it's time to go. I think the only sort of last dish effort that they have in this case that could prove viable, and I'm watching it very closely over the next few days, is this notion of a change of venue. Donald Trump, I think from the very start, knew that he did not want to try this case in the county of Manhattan or in uh, New York County. And I think that one of the reasons why we've seen that change of venue is because he believes that if he can't get a more favorable jury elsewhere, he can at least get the delay that he wants to not start the trial as quickly as possible. And so that would be, in my opinion, the last probable uh, outlet that he might have not to start jury selection next week when it's expected to begin. And so over the next few days, everyone should be paying attention to when that decision comes down. Now, Lisa, meanwhile, turning to the classified documents case here in Florida, the judge overseeing the case issued a ruling on special counsel Jack Smith's request to keep the names of government witnesses sealed. How did she rule? She ruled for the special counsel, Jose, and that was a very much anticipated ruling because 
had she ruled against the special counsel's office and ordered a second time that nearly two dozen witness names be revealed, you can expect that the special counsel's office would have immediately appealed that ruling and potentially even asked for her removal from the case. However, in yesterday's decision, Aileen Cannon siding with the special counsel's office, saying that the protection of witness identities was a very important variable in the lead up to trial. She did, however, side with Trump on one other important thing. She said that witnesses' prior statements, the substance of those statements, can be unsealed so long as details that would lead someone to identify those witnesses are themselves redacted. So by April 22nd, we can expect to see things like those witnesses' statements to the FBI on paper with lots of the identifying details taken out, but we will get to see what those witnesses told the FBI and prosecutors about the allegations in the indictment. Look for that on April 22nd. I know I am. Lisa Rubin and Charles Coleman, we all will be. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. And please make sure to join us for our special coverage on Monday of Trump's first criminal trial. Anna Cabrera and I will kick off our programming. Andrew Mitchell, Chris Chancing, and Katie Tour pick things up in the afternoon. It all begins Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, right here on MSNBC. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.